Hello, everyone. This is Luke Johnson from Noetic, the Humanities Teaching App. We have a very special episode today. We will be analyzing a poem by Charles Baudelaire called The Confiteur of the Artist, or The Confession of the Artist. I'm sure I've butchered his name in the title of the poem already. And join, this is a first for us. We are doing a three-way conversation via Google Hangout. Um, it is, we will be talking today with Sophie Lacour, uh, Lacour in, in, in France, right? Sophie, do you want, do you want to introduce yourself real quick? Uh, hello everyone. <laughs> so, um, I'm living, uh, in, uh, uh, Brittany in France and I, uh, I work in computer science and I, I am uh, very happy to, to re to talk about this poem, which I like very much. <laughs> we're, we're very happy to have you. And as always, the inevitable Robert Schutt, which many people know from the work we've done on Sword Kierkegaard. Now, what I've done, um, what I've done to begin this session is that I have um, put my own recitation in English of the poem at the front of this, of this and Sophie did a, a recitation of it in French, the, so that was her reading. Um, I think what we're going to do is maybe kind of just go around the virtual table and talk about why we chose to discuss this poem. Um, Sophie, would you mind going first? Um, why why did, I, did I choose to uh, this poem? <laughs> okay. Uh, it was because uh, I found it very uh, moving because it made me feel about, it made me think about uh, some experiences that I had in my life, uh, especially when I, I am in walking in nature, and uh, it um, it makes me th it makes me uh, feel some things, and <laughs> it remind me uh, it reminded me of of this and a particular experience I had in uh, last October. Uh, <laughs> I would probe deeper, but I don't know how much you want to elaborate on that. Um, should we move on to Robert, or do you want to say more? Uh, maybe we can talk about this later, or after. Sure, we, of course, of course. After we read, we read the poem. Poem. <laughs> of course, of course, of course. Robert, what about you? Why did you gravitate towards this poem? Well. Uh, Actually, this was something that you kind of brought up to me, as well as other things. You're kind of the Renaissance man, you know, you've got your fingers and a little bit of everything here. So poetry wasn't my first choice, but I certainly uh, am willing to ex experience uh, new things. Poetry is certainly one of those new things. I've never really been exposed to it outside of uh, my high school days, uh, and usually there it's, we're not really serious, you know, a high school kid isn't really too serious about poetry, at least I wasn't. So uh, I didn't really learn too much about it. But uh, when you brought it up, I started to read about it and take it a lot more seriously. And I can see, uh, and actually Kierkegaard, my study of Kierkegaard helps me in this because he's really part a part poet. I mean, a lot of things he writes is very poetical. So it wasn't that big of a transition to get into this poetry. And this is a kind of poetry that's a little different because it doesn't rhyme. It's a poetry, uh, you know, it's kind of a it's different close. rhyme. Yeah, it has a rhythm to it. And uh, it's just easier for me to gravitate towards this kind of poetry perhaps and try to figure out you know, some of the more complicated rhythms and rhymes and stuff. So this was a good poem for me to start out with, I guess, to start my new venture in poetry. Yeah, I think Sophie uh, brought up the point here that this is an unconventional type of poem. It's a prose poem, um, which abandons a lot of the traditional structure that a lot of English poetry has. And um, I think Baudelaire was, from what I understand, pretty innovative in his use of the prose poem. It, it, Sophie, since you're over there in France, you know, um, how, how is, what's his reception like over there? Does everybody know who Charles Baudelaire is? I mean, yeah, he's he, hard, uh, yeah. What's, what's, how, how do you encounter Baudelaire in, 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 in France? We learned his poems at school, in high school. I, I learned the, uh, the Albatros, uh, poem 
so yes, everybody uh, learns uh, Baudelaire in high school. I think that's so fantastic. And you and I were talking off camera before we started going that you studied philosophy in high school too. And I just think about how Only envious, one year. Well, even that, I, <laughs> how, how I wish, and part of what motivated the noetic is the fact that our, the American high school system doesn't incorporate these elements that other European uh, institutions have. No, no. At least public high school, um, if you're going to study philosophy, uh, it's usually an elective and not many people elect to take it. And, um, well, I don't know. I can't really speak on this. The, it's been a while since I was in high school, so I can't really speak about the current state of it. But my, um, it, my experience with that education at every level could have been better. Let's just say that. Um, so... Uh, may I'll just say something real quick about why I like this poem. Uh, I don't really know why I like this poem at first. I mean, except for the fact that it was so harmonious to my ears. When I read it aloud, and I believe every poem should be read aloud because that's truly how it's supposed to be experienced. I did something I didn't really figure out until I was like 31 years old uh, when I was like not understanding why Goethe's Faust, Faust was 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 a masterpiece. And I started reading it aloud and then it all came, to, came, to, came together in my head in this occasion that I realized, oh, okay, I get it. And when I read this thing aloud, I said, oh, this is a kindred spirit to Soren Kierkegaard and Friedrich Nietzsche, uh, the two philosophers that got me down the road of the contemplative life. So there must be something in this, this Baudelaire character, um, even though I don't really understand the subject. And I, I, last night I started to break the poem down. I think there's something um, that he's trying to get at that is in harmony with those thinkers to some level. And we'll get it. We'll get into it, but um, stylistically, he just resonated with me as an intellectual soulmate in the same uh, uh, in the same way that Nietzsche and Kierkegaard did. So, 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 um, why don't we why don't we go through a kind of a, a line by line analysis, and we can kind of take turns um, uh, talking about what each line meant to us. And and Robert, I elected you to. To read the line, and I guess maybe you should first, maybe you should first say what the line said to you, and then maybe Sophie can add something, and then maybe I'll go third. How about that? Sounds like a good beginning here. All okay. right. So first line of the poem. Okay. How penetrating is the end of an autumn day? Ah, yes, penetrating enough to be painful even. Uh, so that's the first line that I have. Uh, it isn't always, it, 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 let me just bring up also, the, the poem isn't always printed line by line. So the way I broke it up may be a little different than the way you guys broke it up. So uh, if, if, if you want me to read a little bit more, let me know. No, but that's no. kind of where I stopped. Okay. So no, the, that was the first line. line. Yeah. Okay. I got the sense right from the opening words that uh, this is going to be perhaps a depressing poem. This isn't going to be a, you know, a humorous uh, Ogden Nash type of poem. This is going to be something uh, very deep, penetrating. Uh, just by the, the, the words that he uses, penetrating, he uses that twice, painful. Uh, it kind of gives you that uh, uh, idea. Also, uh, some of the things that uh, uh, Luke had pointed me to, some references that I read about the, the type of poetry that... Uh, uh, Boudreau is using, he, he uses this method of uh, synesthetics. Uh, I'm probably mispronouncing that word, but synesthesia, syn is that, is that synesthesia. the, the, is that the process synesthesia. of using, of using synesthesia right. in poetics? Yeah, he uses uh, two kind of different things uh, to kind of point something out here, like, uh, Let's see which one like a day and painful you know you don't you don't usually have a day i mean we use that expression but that's kind of a an example of a, at least how i put it together an example of pain and a day two different things that don't usually belong together but he brings them together to make his point uh, and that's all i have on the opening line sophie what about you um well i don't know if you ever have whoops uh, during the, the autumn, uh, but I always feel uh, the autumn season when when you walk uh, in the woods, for instance, and you see the the leaves uh, which are falling, and it's a uh, it's always a bit depressing, I think, because um, 
it's beautiful, but at the same time, it uh, resonates uh, with uh, with you, with me actually, and it um, it makes me think about how time pass and my uh, my childhood <laughs> when I used to go on walks with my parents in the woods and. Uh, I think about uh, so many memories uh, when I, I have walks, and especially autumn. It's a uh, it's a season which is uh, which is depressing because we had the summer before this. There was sun, and then it's a bit like dying. <laughs> right. Yeah, and 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 Sophie, I think you and I um picked up on this in the same way um i wrote late last night i wrote a commentary um and i asked myself well you know, what makes for a penetrating end to an autumn day why is that penetrating and i i and my answer to that was the end of an autumn day and i think i and i take this to mean the end of daylight is filled with penetrating rays that illumine beautiful that like the beautiful death of leaves about to break off from the nourishing tree and and I thought that 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 this sort of penetrating thing that that Baudelaire is talking about is that we see beauty in in the expiration of life. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, it's, that's why I felt exactly it's the it's the idea that uh, life's uh, we are dying, that life uh, we are separ separated from the the tree. We are like a, a leaf. Which is falling, and we are uh, there. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, so, Bob, would you like to read the the next the next line for us? Sure. Uh, for there are certain delicious sensations whose vagueness does not prevent them from being intense, and none more keen than the perception of the infinite. Uh, this was a good line for me. I, I, I thought this line was very meaningful. Uh, and again, we see kind of he uses this idea of delicious sensation. Uh, he kind of blends that into the idea of the infinite, uh, which is not normally how we would view the infinite, perhaps. Uh, and the idea that was expressed to me is that uh, even though at best we have a vague sensation of the infinite, it causes a lot of intense thoughts as we meditate upon the infinite. I mean, lots of people, especially poets, and Kierkegaard, of course, speaks a lot about the infinite, and it's such a vague term, but yet it creates within us all sorts of imaginations of trying to think, what does what is the infinite? How can I even begin to perceive the infinite? It's like we have an inclination that there is an infinite, but we don't have much more than that. Uh, and it creates a lot of intense feelings, uh, some uh, fear. You know, just thinking of the infinite, uh, if we relate it to life continuing on and on and on, it's it could be something beautiful, but at the same time, it could be something fearful as well. Something that is just <sighs> makes us more aware of the things that we don't understand. Maybe that's a good way to put it. Uh, maybe that's why he chose the word infinite, because the idea of being infinite is something I think we all humans can say we, we're aware of it, but we really don't understand it as that yeah. ability to to create that sense of awe, fear, and uh, within us. Yes. Sophie, what do you think? Uh, when, I, when I walk in, in uh, nature, um, I've, I have this feeling that I, have, I am a, a little bit disconnected from my everyday reality, like as if I were out of time, and uh, I am uh, in a different state actually, and uh, I'm not thinking the same way. I'm, I'm a bit, uh, as if I were dreaming, but I'm not exactly dreaming. And, uh, so um, sometimes you can think at uh, 
all your life or all the world and your your way of thinking is not the same uh, you're not perhaps in the present moment that you are more uh, uh, thinking uh, yeah you are in another dimension <laughs> Yeah, I think I, 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 lo I love the way that you put that. And I think what, what I like the fact that we're taking turns doing this. And I, I'm, I'm not cutting you off, am I? Is there more that you wanted to say about that? No, no, I, I, you, can, uh, you can continue if you want. Um, what I think, what I like about us taking turns and going through the lines here is because I think we each keep adding a layer with our interpretation. And Robert's right to point out that. Um, this the this this vague notion of the infinite and its correlation to the existential thinker sword and Kierkegaard and Sophie I think it's right to point out how being in nature gives us a sense of transcending into another dimension and I wonder if I can add something to this um, he's talking about you know these penetrating sensations of walking in uh, the 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 autumn day about their vagueness and it seems like their vagueness if I'm reading him correctly, stems from an ambiguity of both an affirmation of life and uh, and 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 its death. And I wonder if there if somehow the perception into the infinite is to be able to see life and death commingling in some way. I wonder if somehow that glimpse into the infinite is to see simultaneously the beginning and the end concurrently now i don't even know what i don't really know what that means i don't know if all all beautiful experiences necessarily have that commingling of life and death but it seems to be just when something when something beautiful is decaying is when we get this glimpse into the infinite did anyone else pick up on that ambiguity or that dual nature of beauty and how it both elevates us into another dimension and as it as we get through the poem leads to a kind of sickness did anyone else mm. get that or is that just me no i can relate to this and that's the reason why one of the reason why i like this poem so much uh, it's the you can you can uh, you have feelings of death and feelings of life together mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think I agree with you too, Luke. I think that he's planting the seeds of that. I think he develops this poem, uh, and uh, he, he, this is definitely one of the ideas that he's going to get to: is the the commingling of beauty as well as uh, ugliness and fear together. Uh, it comes out a little bit later, I think, more intensely. But yeah, I think you're right to see that now to see the seeds of that. Okay. Robert, why don't you read the next line for us then? <clears throat> okay. Uh, he has a great delight who drowns his gaze in the immensity of sky and sea. Uh, so here he's, he's continuing that picture that, uh, that uh, I think uh, Sophie is actually alluding to and, and yourself as the, the autumn day, uh, looking up in nature, seeing the sky and the sea. Uh, it is interesting terms that he uses of drowning uh, his gaze. Uh, I think that uh, kind of paints a, a different picture for us that uh, he's getting lost in something. He's drowning. He's being overwhelmed. The idea of drowning, you know, I've had a, a, a close drowning experience in my life. Uh, and when you're drowning and you're just helplessly underwater and you can't breathe, it's, it's, there's no way to explain how that feels. But I think that's what he's trying to do here. But, but in a different way, that he's being overwhelmed by his view of the sky and the sea. And like you said, he's he's being taken to a higher level in, in just compre trying to comprehend through his uh, sensations of the sky and the sea. And, and I think, it, again, we'll see how he contrasts that in the very next line. But that's where I have this line ending. Sophie? Uh, I I think I I understand uh, this line so much because I love uh, watching at the sea and sky and uh, 
it's just something I really, really love. That's why um, I, uh, I really like uh, to have uh, walks uh, near the sea uh, because uh, I, I think it's so, so beautiful. <laughs> and uh, and I can feel uh, this great delight. <laughs> right. I, and I, I think, you know, I have some, gosh, I, maybe I should say, say something about this now because I think it will set up the next line, however Bob carves it up, because the next line is, well, uh, it's, it's a long one. But to me, this reminded me of Kant's um, third critique, the critique of beauty, or the critique of judgment, I should say, and specifically uh, how he dealt with the sublime. Um, I don't know if you all are familiar with that. I know it's kind of esoteric, but Kant talks about the sublime in, a, in juxtaposition to the beautiful as this thing that takes our breath away. It's sheer immensity, immensity. It's, it's infinitude. We can't even conceive it. We don't have a concept under which it can fit. And it's so massive that we also can feel it annihilate ourselves. So it gives rise to this incredible aesthetic enjoyment, but it also causes terrible fear that it will destroy us. And I, I don't wanna preempt Bob too much, but the next line, solitude, silence, the incomparable chastity of the azure, a little sail trembling upon the horizon. Um, I think there's something going on there with Baudelaire trying to describe that aesthetic experience of the sublime, of, of seeing something so much bigger than ourselves and having our identity uh, being destroyed by it. Um, so I'll, I'll say that, but I think that's why this is so penetrant, this experience of beholding um, the autumn day or the sky or the Azure Sea or whatever is so intense, perhaps too intense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's going to he's going to give us a, a kind of the flip side of this. Uh, and he's going to I think he's going to begin here to give us the flip side of the beauty. Uh, I'll, I'll just repeat that line that you said so I can read it in, uh, can, in rhythm can you here. Can you read it all the way to the um, to lost semicolon? To, to semicolon? Yeah, that's yeah. what I, I was going to do. That I was breaking it up in shorter pieces. Like I said, I wasn't sure how how to break this up, but I can yeah. do that. Yeah. Solitude, silence, the incomparable chastity of the azure, a little sail trembling upon the horizon. By its very littleness and isolation, imitating the irredeemable, existence, the melodious monotone of the surge. All these things thinking through me and I through them or in the grandeur of the reverie, the ego is swiftly lost. So uh, I think he's giving us another layer here, uh, kind of maybe a little bit on the flip side. Uh, he's talking about sound and color, which is kind of uh, one of the things of this uh, uh, synthesis here uh, where people hear colors, and they they see sound and he's trying to put this together in order to create a whole new poetic experience for us uh he's speaking about first of all he's speaking about how everything is so grand the infinite the uh how overwhelming the sky and the sea are and now he's giving us a little contrast this is little tiny sail on the sea and the sail being a uh, metonymy for a boat just a little boat and you have this this picture now of a little tiny boat bouncing around in the sea which we've probably all all seen uh, and i get the idea of his extreme sense of isolation and guilt here is beginning to come out i think the poem is now becoming a little bit more personal for him expressing some of 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 who he is something of what's going on inside him as to why he's writing this poem because i think people write poetry to express something with deep within themselves okay and it's not just to make us feel good uh it's probably more for the individual to express themselves as it is for the reader 
Uh, and that's kind of how I approached this. I, I approached this poem as, what can I learn about Baudelaire from this poem? And myself as well. Uh, what, do you, so what, do you, this, what do you think he's disclosing here? Um, his sense of isolation. Uh, he's opening up to us about this isolation uh, and his sense of, of guilt, his smallness uh, relating to nature's vastness, uh, how he's, you know, like Sophie was saying, and you as well, that uh, the sea and the sky are beautiful and they, the beauty almost approaches the infinite, but yet there's a certain fear because the opposite side is how small am I when I compare myself to the sky? How small am I when I compare myself to the sea? It makes people aware, or it makes him anyway, and myself aware of our insignificance in the world as one individual human being. Um, that's how I took that, that last line there. So uh, I, I, took, I took it a little bit differently, but I want to hear what Sophie has to, and I'm not saying that you're wrong, Bob, and there's really no wrong way to uh, interpret a poem, but I, it had a slightly different effect on me, but I, I'll save it until I hear Sophie's verdict about this line. Sophie, what did you think about this line? Yes, it was one of the lines which made me think the most about uh, an experience I had uh, last October, because I was in a very, very beautiful place, and I, uh, I was alone. I was having a walk alone in this place, uh, and uh, it was in a pa um, particular uh, occasion, and uh, I was praying at the same time, <laughs> and um, I thought I thought a lot about uh, all my life, my childhood, and like um, as if a part of me, uh, who I was when I was a child, was dead, <laughs> and. Uh, like I didn't have any uh, uh, land landmarks, uh, I think, and um, I felt the the solitude, and uh, and uh, when I watched, uh, there was uh, the sea, and when I watched at the at the sea, it was so so beautiful, but at the same time, it was like a dream. It was like. I was, um, everything around me was alive, but I was not alive. So mm, was yes, yes, I wanna, I wanna bring that out some more. <laughs> that is a very important thing you just said. And, uh, um, yes, I felt uh, small and I felt alone and, uh, and everything around me was beautiful. But I was not happy at this, to be there at the same time. I, I love the way that you put that, and I think I think it both confirms what Bob was saying, and maybe a little bit of what I'm about to say. So I think you are. If Bob is the thesis and I'm the antithesis, you're the synthesis. <laughs> um, I, I really, I really. I really latched on to this line, all these things thinking through me and I through them, for in the grandeur of the reverie, the ego is swiftly lost. So I thought this was huge, all these things thinking through me and I through them. Like, I'm like, what is going on here? I said, what, you know, how do I make sense of this line? And it seemed to be some kind of pantheism where everything might be the divine point of view and the ego is obliterated and of course there's an isolating sadness to having our ego obliterated um but on the on the positive side of it there there's this consciousness of the interconnected nature of nature and that this this might make for why this is such a penetrating and intense experience is that the whole damn thing is divine and that we might see ourselves contra Kierkegaard uh, absorbed into some larger thing. Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if it's right to call this. The, the, the most interesting thing is that 
I thought this was really interesting is it is that as I'm beholding the autumn day or the azure sea or sky, I'm thinking it, but then it also has its own subjectivity where it's thinking me. Now we'll go on. The next line I think is really interesting because there's yeah. a different type of thinking, but it's, it's kind of like Hegel's um, dialectic where like, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I don't know. Everything yeah, the, is unfolding. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like where this, where this, this, you know, that God contemplates Himself through us or something, like something like that. Uh, do you guys want to add anything to that level of interpretation? I think the next line is going to bring that, uh, bring that out a little bit clearer to me. But let, let me see if Sophie has anything to add. I was, uh, what I was thinking is when you are alone in nature and when there is no other human being, uh, somehow you, you feel close, closer to, to what is around you, the, the trees, the, the, the animals, the, you, you feel like you can uh, have empathy towards them more than towards human beings sometimes. I think that's a wonderful point. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, to bring out, I think uh, I think about something I think about Sophie, and it seems, seems like something that you may think about a lot. And I'd like to hear is that I live in the country, and I I, I frequently go on walks and listen to poetry and audiobooks and things like that. And I think about how good it is for my soul, and, and how that's against how how many how many other people must feel like they have to be concentrated in metropolitan areas to really be living life. And I think about that detachment from nature and, and how it stunts that spiritual ascendance or transcendence that that Baudelaire and so many other people seem to be getting at. I, it seems like you and I may share that perspective. Actually, I'm living in a city and uh, <laughs> I really love to be in nature. So yeah. it's hard sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, but well, I mean, yeah, yeah I, I, I just want to add a little bit to that is that uh, I, I don't do it as much anymore now, but uh, uh, I used to go on walks like in the middle of the day, maybe in the afternoon, go on walks and, and whether it's the, the nature around me, or probably a little bit of everything, the rhythm of me walking, uh, the, the, the change of my breathing, fresh air, I don't know what it is, but that's a lot of times I've had my best ideas, my best insights into different things through my own self-conversation. I think we all do that. We have yes. self-conversations. And th that makes it easier for me to talk to myself when I'm out there walking around. And it's those times that I've had, like I say, the best insights that I can come. I couldn't wait to hurry up and get home. Matter of fact, it got so so overwhelming i used to bring a recorder with me because i thought i can't forget this idea and i know i'm going to forget it by the time i get home so i'd whip out my recorder and i'd record it so i'd have a some kind of a, a record of it so those walks right. in the country are important well yes and this raises an interesting question and we'll hopefully get to that later in the poem is what and it's all capped off of what sophie's talk talked about about how being in nature allows us to approach this dimension, this other dimension. And I think we have to ask ourselves, what are we getting a glimpse of? Um, is it just a mood? Is it just a feeling of mm -hmm. interconnectedness and our insignificance or our significance as a part of this massive whole of the universe of nature? Or are we transport to a realm that gives us unique poetical, philosophical insights that we, that we can go home and write down. I mean, Kant was notorious for his daily walks, and I'm sure he felt like many of his insights uh, developed in such a same manner. But I think this leads into the next line. So Robert, why don't you read that next line and we can talk about yeah. this a little bit more. Yeah, I, I'm almost thinking this line should have been read with the other line. <laughs> it's kind of hard to break him up in pieces. Yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. But I'll just read this to the, to the period here. Uh, they think, I say, but musically and picturesquely, without quibbles, without syllogisms, without deductions. Uh, and that, I, I, I did enjoy that line. I thought that line was very, has said a lot because uh, 
he's saying that there's a conversation that we have with the grandeur of of the autumn day and the walks like we were saying with the surrounding environment around us that speaks to us but not in logical expressions uh you know not in deductions and syllogisms which is the way we we tend to converse a lot of times uh but a different kind of words it's the kind of words that gives us that insight whatever it is that inspires us uh it has no words and has no substitutes for the real and almost daily i'm reminded that our words are really are really estimates of reality but we have to remember our words are not reality that reality transcends our words these are our best attempt at trying to explain reality but it always comes short and it's on these mm -hmm. walks when we see and experience nature uh that we we rise to a high, you know, we rise to a higher level, and momentarily, perhaps we are there, uh, soon to be dropped back into the world again. Yeah, I think the question, interesting question, is there. What is the there? Um, mm -hmm. But let's see what Sophie has to say about this line. Yes, I would have so much to to say about this. <laughs> please, <and>, uh, please. <laughs> um, I, yes, do I think it made me think about uh, how, as human beings, we we talk a lot, we, we try to um, express our thoughts using words, and we are, and there is a kind of um, vision of intelligence, which is a, uh, um, uh, which word? I, uh, <laughs> I'm just sorry. Um, yes. Not proud, but a smug, smug. I think an, an, an intelligence which is a. Uh, uh, we think we are super superior to nature, to animals. We think we are more intelligent because we can speak, because we can, we can make uh, deductions uh, and etc. We can we have reason, and uh, we think we are more intelligent because of our mental abilities. And because we are able to express uh, our, our thoughts using a, a, a demonstration, like a mathematic demonstration. Uh, and uh, we think uh, so, and that animals are, uh, we think we, it's when we forget about our feelings, we, we are just. Um, uh, a mental um, engine <laughs> and um, but there is another way of thinking there is another form of intelligence which is not verbal which is more uh, thinking with, with your heart with uh, pictures music and uh, it's less um, maybe less rigorous but at the same time, it's it may be uh, we can have um, insights that we wouldn't have if we used only uh, logical reasoning. And uh, and I think uh, some some people say it's the left brain or the right and the right brain. I don't know. It hasn't really been uh, scientifically. Uh, well uh, explained, but uh, the problem is in a uh, in society and in particular in the working world is that we use only one intel intelligence, the the cold intelligence, and uh, we have to separate this from our feelings, our cre creativity, and uh, so. One intelligence is valued a lot more than the other form. I think it's a beautiful way of saying that. Mm -hmm. um, something that I I'm, I may want to put an emphasis on in my commentary in this line is, well, the following. I, something I thought when I read this, I asked myself, who is doing the thinking here? Um, and it's the setting or the constituents of the setting doing the thinking. 
um, but they do not think like humans do. Um, it's it's not it's contra reason. It's not reason. They think musically or like a picture. And I, I ask myself, well, what is what does it mean to think this way? To think musically or picturesquely? And I thought to myself, well, maybe we can learn something about this mode of thinking from what it is not. It's, it is not reasoning towards a truth. Perhaps these other forms of thinking are clues to the infinite. And I, I'm starting to wonder if he's getting at something platonic, if this is a reference to Platonism. And I really wish I understood Platonism better. Um, I'm wondering if the settings thinking picturesquely or musically are the sort of emanation of the, of, of the forms. And um, if, if, if everything is thinking through him and him thinking through it and everything sort of got this divine aspect, but also an emanation of something Platonist, it, it seems like almost everything is a portal to this other dimension that Sophie referenced early on. Did you guys, did you guys think that at all? That it wasn't just us that's doing the thinking, but it's that it's things that we might not even consider to be life, such as waves crashing or dead leaves or the or the whole ecosystem that has a sort of thought to it, that it has an emanation of some sort of divine thought that doesn't necessarily speak in words but in images and music and i i can't help but think and i don't know my plato very well but it seems like it's brushing up against maybe something akin to the music of the spheres or in and and talk of that of that nature of course that deals with you know intergalactic planetary systems and stuff like that but I, ju I just feel like there's something platonist about what's going on here. I, I'll leave it at that. I, I don't. I think it's supposed to be inconclusive. I don't think but Baudelaire thought poems were philosophical treatises that needed to be um, have truth in them in the same way that a, that a philosophy book does. But it seems to be hinting at a platonist influence there. I don't know. I'll I'll, I'll stop uh, talking and let you guys weigh in on that. I think, Sophie, yeah, I think Sophie has something she wants to say here. I read that uh, Baudelaire was influenced by Platonic uh, uh, philo philosophy. Um, and um, yes, I don't know if you, if you read about the Plato's cave. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Allegory. And, of course, uh, yeah. So, some people today uh, are very interested uh, in this, uh, in this uh, allegory, because uh, they think that um, the world, we, the reality we experience through our senses, is not the real reality, and that there is a, another reality which is more uh, spiritual, um, and uh, that what we see um, may be an illusion. So um, I think uh, I think Baudelaire was, was has had this this kind of opinion too. What What do you think, Robert? Um, I don't know if I would say that I'm more Kantian uh, on this or not, but I see what happens as uh, I perceive it. In other words, uh, these are all expressions of my perception uh, not so much that the ocean has a mind or the sky or the sea ha has a mind of its own but rather I project my mind onto these objects and I see them in relationship to my thoughts and who I am so they they come to me through my senses and then I interpret them uh, I know that probably sounds a little Kantian, uh, but uh, that's anyway how I look at it, that my perception is really the key. How do I perceive it uh, and the effect that it has upon me as an individual uh, more than the Platonic ideas? So at least in this particular area, I, I, I would say so. Well, that, that, that's perfectly legitimate. Would you, <laughs> like to, would you like to read the next line? Because I think this is where we start getting into... 
the yeah. difficulty of comprehending such beauty. Right. Yeah. I'm going to read the next two sentences because I think they they go together. If I if I separate them, I think we'll get two different ideas. So I'm going to put them together because I think okay. the second one helps define the first one. Sure. These these thoughts, as they arise in me or spring forth from external objects, soon become always too intense. The energy working within pleasure creates an uneasiness, a positive suffering. And uh, it was that last little piece of positive suffering for me helped me define that whole line. It's who, does like that would, sound, who does that sound like? Yeah, positive suffering. Yeah, sounds like our boy Kierkegaard. Uh, but it seems to to redefine the whole. If if you were to leave that out, it would you would almost take it differently uh, about the intensity. And I would have been saying that uh, well, all these things that we see, these external objects that are speaking through me and to me, uh, are just very intense. And I would see it in a very positive light. And maybe that's how he did mean it. But based upon this next line, where the energy working within pleasure creates an uneasiness, a positive suffering. I think he's now redefining it and saying, yeah, that's true. And I have all these positive things, all these beautiful things going on around me, creating this sense of euphoria in me, right? Uh, but then there's also something else I notice, that this pleasure creates a bit of uneasiness in me and a sense of positive suffering, uh, almost as though there's a sense of guilt by enjoying all of this uh, that comes out. That in the sense the pleasure is saying maybe I'm not worthy of this, or maybe it's saying simply that uh, who am I in contrast to all of this? I, and I know that, that he was that uh, Baudelaire was very much obsessed with the idea of original sin uh, and man's sinfulness and his uh, not being able to quite be forgiven for those sins. So he carried around with him a sense of guilt, knowing from his background. So I'm kind of reading that in a little bit, this, in, in the sense that uh, this may be working on that sense of guilt that he has about who he is. And maybe he's not worthy of all this beauty. Or he sees... Somehow he sees guilt in his beauty. Uh, that, that's about what I got from that. Yeah, Sophie, what about you? Um, yes, sometimes when we experience intense, feeling, feel intense feelings, in the, even if they are very positive, sometimes, uh, very often, we have negative feelings at the same time. Well, at least it happens to me uh, when something very... Uh, amazing happens to me and I'm extremely happy. I always have fear or that it will be over, that I will be somehow punished because I experience so much happiness that it's gonna, it's gonna be harder after this. It's gonna end. It's can't, it can't be forever. I Perfect think happiness is, is, is not forever. I, I love the way that both you and Bob are describing it. Um, and I might be adding a little bit more to it, but I don't want to cut you off. Is there anything else you'd like to say about it? Uh, no, I think you can, you, can, uh, you can say what you, you had to say. I think that's a really wonderful way that you phrased it. I remember uh, those feelings of trying to hold on to a moment and, and anticipating its demise and sort of ex experiencing a little bit of the despair while I'm in the midst of happiness. I think it's a really wonderful way to say it. And, and Bob, I like the way that you talked about the guilt uh, and the original sin that Baudelaire presupposed all human beings to have. And what I, what I get here is that, it's, it's that this intensity of pleasure is not kind of unlike sort of staring at something beautiful, uh, such as the celestial orb, uh, the sun, and going blind from it. I think, what we might be seeing here is what our good friend Kierkegaard would describe as the, the despair that is endemic to the aesthetic uh, stage of existence. Um, the, you know, in aesthetic life, there, in the sickness unto death, Kierkegaard will speak of unconscious despair, which may be a little bit like um, the despair that Sophie speaks of, like when we're happy at a birthday party, but we know the party will end. 
Um, then there's sort of the despair over the earthly where uh, we don't want something ripped away from us. But then there's a despair over the eternal when we realize that we've attached the passion of infinity to something that is not maybe the infinite. And I wonder if that original sin, that guilt, those feelings of an easiness and the termination of our happiness um, are on display here, that, that the poet intrinsically knows that beauty is not what we ought to be so exercised and worked up about, that it's, it's a misplaced passion of infinity. And, that's, and that when we misplace that, that passion that I think Kierkegaard would say is only appropriate for the religious object, we get this sickness mm -hmm. that weighs us down. We get this guilt. We get this form of, uh, of, of sinfulness. And um, I think that especially comes out uh, in the last line, which we'll get to. But um, I think I think we're all sort of interpreting this in the same way. I, I, I don't know if I'm way off base with what I've injected into the conversation. I think that was beautiful, Luke. I really, you know, that was, that was great. Very, very well put. Um, kind of, I, I think this poem, you, you were right on the edge of it and I thought you were going to say it. Um, that this poem almost leads us into Kierkegaard's The Sickness Unto Death. I think there's a lot of common ground between this poem and The Sickness Unto Death. It kind of leads us right. Would you agree with that? Did you see oh, it? Total oh, totally, yeah. Okay. Okay, I'll go to the next two sentences here. I see these two together as well. My nerves are too tense to give other than clamoring and dolorous vibrations. And now the profundity of the sky dismays me. Its limpidity exacerbates me. Uh, exasperates me, sorry. Uh, and here I see, he, he uses the words clamoring meaning noise and dolorous meaning sadness. Uh, my nerves are too tense to give other than noise and sad vibrations, uh, so to speak. Uh, in such a state that he's in now, uh, he can't seem to put what he wants to say into words, uh, only into words of sadness and despair. So he's really flipped over from the beauty and the infinite, and now all of a sudden he's trying to explain his experiences through uh, what he would say. All I can do is just use words that are uh, clamorous, just like noise, uh, like St. Paul would say a, a tingling symbol he uses in, in Corinthians. Uh, and the profundity of the sky dismays me. Now what was beautiful all of a sudden has now turned into something different. Uh, it's having a different effect upon him. Uh, it's clearness, it's limpidity or clearness exasperates me. Uh, so he sees the wisdom of nature in sharp contrast to his own confusion and it frustrates him. Uh, I think this is where he was going here, that a lot of times when we see the, the beauty and the clearness of nature, uh, that everything is so, so well-defined in nature. And when we compare our own thoughts to it, our own thoughts are all over the place. It seems like nature knows where it's going and it's going to get there sooner or later. But I'm not quite so sure about myself. I'm not quite so sure about my life. If I really know where I'm going, and I don't even know if I'm going to know when I get there. So there's a certain, a lot of uncertainty that is kind of, uh, he calls it, uh, ex exasperates me, uh, frustrates me because of that issue. How do I know which turns to make? How do I know which decisions to make? I'm so, uh, confused about things and I never really know if this road is going to lead me to life or death, success or failure, where nature doesn't seem to have that issue. Sophie, what about you? Uh, it's funny because uh, it made me think of uh, an article I read, it's, which it seems to be off topic, but uh, it was comparing the effects of drugs on the brain to uh, the uh, when, what happens when you, you fall in love with someone and the chemistry and everything and <laughs> how you have feelings of euphoria and then you feel very, very, very sad 
because you have you are frustrated and because you you don't have uh, the the brain you have highs and lows and uh, because he he had a, a four year and very uh, much pleasure before then he's uh, in his low uh, low period and uh, everything which he he found was beautiful before becomes ugly becomes aggressive becomes violent <laughs> and uh, that's what it makes it made me feel, feel think about <laughs> uh, Sophie I'm so glad that you brought that up because I think if we I think these lines and especially the next one or two um, uh, if we take it if we take it into the context of his larger authorship I'm I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with his poem hymn to beauty um, and also uh, the compendium of poems that he wrote Fleurs du Mal I'm, I'm sure you are as we've done research for all this Fleurs du Mal right Sophie translates into English as uh, flowers of evil and it, it I get the sense here that Baudelaire is trying to intimate that one, when one really comprehends what beauty is and the aesthetic processes that it runs the individual through, that there is this depression, there is this letdown, there is this addictive, um, uh, uh, this addiction that we need to be cleansed of, of it. We go into sort of, um, when an addict is trying to get clean, they go into convulsions or something like that. And so, even the thought of after you've been clean and sober for a while, going back to that thing makes you shudder because you have this association of the pangs of overcoming that drug. Not on, not on like, I, I mean, some people would say as to me of how maybe I am closed down to love because as a euphoric as it is, I know how hard it is to get, uh, to recover from its absence. Um, or, uh, you know, I used to, I used to, uh, smoke cigarettes or have hangovers and things like that, and I avoid them entirely now. Um, I think Baudelaire wants to illustrate the danger of beauty, and that's you know that's hinted at at Fleurs du Mal as well, and the Hymn to Beauty poem is that maybe beauty isn't this platonic thing that gets us in touch with the divine. Maybe it's a tool of something much more sinister. Um, it was the, I mean, Bob, you know, from a theological perspective, uh, was it, I mean, did not Satan point out the, um, the appetizing appeal of the, of the apple in the Garden of Eden, right? Mm -hmm. did, did he not show the beauty of, of that flower or that blossom off of, off of that tree? Did he not highlight it? And was that not the thing that seduced Eve and Adam into their fall? And it's almost like he wants to. It, I get the sense here that he he's caught in a, he's caught in a contradiction as a poet. That he he knows how torturous beauty can be and wants to renounce it, but at the same same time can't. But I'll say that's all I have to say about that. I'll I'll I'll, I'll address that more later. Oh, that no, that was great. That was great. Okay, I'm going to do the next two sentences here because I think they, these go together. The, ins the insensibility of the sea, the immutability of the spectacle revolt me. Ah, must one eternally suffer forever to be a fugitive from beauty? Uh, this, again, again, I think he's now really getting into the, the other side of, of why he's writing this poem, what he's trying to express about himself here, uh, saying that nothing can understand or seems to care about his sense of despair. And for this, he's revolted, for it only makes his sense of isolation all the more intense. Uh, I'm coming from the point of view that uh, Baudelaire is in a state of despair. And this poem is written from that point of view uh, all along. And he's leading up to that here. He's saying that such the beauty, the sea, the ocean, the clouds, all this is so beautiful, but it doesn't give a darn about me. You know, it doesn't see me. It doesn't know what I'm suffering. It doesn't feel mm. what I feel. It could care less. It's so isolated from me that it revolts me. You know, 
you know, it's like people shake their fist at the God and say, can't you hear my prayer? Can't you hear what I need? Can't you see what's going on in my life? Uh, and you refuse to help me. It's that kind of uh, uh, him opening up to us here in this poem, telling us about that. Uh, and once again, we have the contrast of suffering with beauty, which he, he which I think was called reversibility. Uh, oh, technically. yes. Oh, yes. So he's using this idea of one thing bringing about the other. Suffering and beauty don't usually go together. Uh, and I think he's using that here to show that what beauty ought to bring is goodness. I mean, that's what we normally relate to beauty is satisfaction, uh, peace, uh, love, all that kind of stuff. But for him, beauty is now beginning to bring out a sense of suffering, which is certainly contrast to the way we would see beauty. We usually see ugliness as bringing, reflecting uh, suffering. But here he's seeing actually that beauty is reflecting uh, suffering that's going on within, within him. Sophie, what would you like to add to that? Um this this sentence um it's um it makes me think that the the artist is uh the is someone which is more sensitive than the ordinary person and as he is more sensitive he can experience uh joy and pleasure which are more intense than the average person but it has a price because he also feels the pain and the negative emotion more intensely. So it's like uh, he's he's um, he has an inner conflict because at the same time he wants to experience this uh, intense emotions, these intense positive emotions, but he knows what is the price. So, I, I yeah, and I can, I can definitely relate to that. Yeah. Um, would so you like to say? He, I'm yeah. sorry. Would you like to say more? So he hesitates between uh, being a, a doing experiencing this or being a fugitive and uh, living a life which is more ordinary, but which. Uh, in which he wouldn't feel really alive. <laughs> Sophie, yeah. Sophie can, can I, may I ask a question to both of you? Uh, uh, do you think that he wants to live a different life here or do you think he's kind of satisfied with the life that he has? I don't think he's satisfied. I think he does. Uh, from what I read, read uh, about him, I think, uh, he he, ex he experienced uh, difficulty and pain uh, in relation to life. He, uh, in French, it uh, it it was uh, written as a mal de vivre, which is uh, the suffering uh, in relation to living, because life. Uh, la yes, they, he had in his mind. Uh, He's an, uh, an idealistic. He has in his mind a, a perfect world where everything is beautiful, everything is uh, perfect. Whereas life is hard. hard. Life is imperfect. There is uh, there is ugliness. There, but there is also well. Let, I'm going to talk about my my own um, experience, but. I often uh, feel like as if life should be different. Life, there is hate, there is poverty, there is uh, so many things which are difficult in life. People are not uh, kind towards towards one another, and I and I feel this difference between my ideals and the reality. Uh, I think that's very well said. Yes, thank you. Um, I can say something I, I identified with this a lot as a, a recovering artist. Um, I think about how often I was chasing, trying to create something beautiful and how the pursuit of that ideal of making something beautiful, um, 
always left me striving, never attaining it and unfulfilled. And then when I was able to concretize the idea, I'd already sort of transcended it and it never really left me with any sort of happiness. And that's why I sort of like Baudelaire intimating here that beauty may be the handmaiden, handmaiden of something evil. Um, also wanted to just piggyback and say something about, about what Bob said earlier um, about how there is this pairing of the beautiful and suffering. I think what I can tell from my limited knowledge of Baudelaire's work, it seems like one of the great virtues of his work is that he is able to find beauty in suffering as well. It's not always beautiful scenarios that he contemplates, such as a autumn day, but that he was able to find beauty in places that other people would have abandoned as ugly and find the beauty within it and and to draw that connection between the decayed, the suffering, the ugly, and the beautiful ever tighter. Um, it just so happens in this poem that we start out with a more bucolic scene and we get to the suffering, but I think there is that reversibility that that Baudelaire was as was good at pointing out. Now, would you call that beauty, or would you call that, uh, I mean, the kind of beauty that we're used to seeing, okay, is pleasing. But do you think that when he talks about those things that we consider ugly, do you think he's saying beauty in a different sense, that it has purpose? In other words, seeing something that, that might be repulsive still has a purpose for us. It, uh, and we can learn from it, and we can uh, benefit from that, in that sense, beauty, rather than in the sense of pleasing. Like to see a starving child, I don't think we could say is actually beautiful in the sense it's pleasing to us, but it can be beneficial to us because we can see in that a sense of, of our potential to help. Uh, it's things like that. What do you think? Uh, you know, I think, I, I think I'd have to give a very limited answer to that. I think maybe that answers some questions about where we go from here after this. Maybe we should look at a poem where he um, uh, dwells on uh, something that we would consider to be ugly or unfortunate. Um, but I think it's, I, I, I think it would be um, a mistake from what I understand of, of Baudelaire's work to read um, overt overt morals into it. I think he's a moralist. I think he has a moral point of view, but I don't know if um, he thinks beauty functions like that where it overtly um, teaches us something about, about what we ought to do or what we could be doing. I don't know. I, I, so I'd have to put a lot of question marks with that statement and maybe we come yeah. back come back to it. I think he's very concerned I don't, I, I don't, I think he views poetry as something very different from something that's end oriented. I think, I, I think he doesn't think it's philosophy. I think he doesn't think it's science. And I think he doesn't think, think it's a moralizing program, but that's not to say that there isn't morality in it. That's not to say there isn't philosophy in it. Um, so I, I'm, Maybe we'll have to come back to that question if that's okay. No, that's fine. I just just popped out of my head there. Don't we discuss that? Okay, I guess I can do the next line. I'm only going to do one more line before the end because uh, the last line I think is is really the uh, the final. Uh, you know, give, gives us a lot more meaning that we can discuss here. So the next line is, "Nature pitiless enchantress." Ever victorious rival, leave me. Tempt my desires and my pride no more. Uh, so he sees himself not so much at one with nature here. You know how people are always saying, you know, I want to blend in, I want to become part of nature. Even religions have developed uh, on that whole idea of becoming one with nature. He doesn't see nature in the same way now all of a sudden. No. Uh, the temptation that I take here is to mean that he's unable to find refuge or at the very least sympathy in nature. Rather, they only, uh, or it only further frustrates him by showing his failure. 
again, his guilt and his sin all the more. So now he sees that other side of nature. So he sees it, and we know that he saw not only nature uh, in a dualistic manner, but he saw God uh, in a dualistic manner as well, meaning he, he viewed them from a good and evil perspective. And so this all actually comes out from the whole idea of how he sees the world and he, well, how he sees everything uh, in a sense of dualism, which means uh, I see good and I see evil in the same thing here. Uh, whether or not they, they can uh, be coalesced into one or whether or not they remain separate, uh, he sees this kind of dualistic idea of nature. So that, uh, that's, it. that's what I have on that line. So, Sophie? uh yes i think it's it's like um a fight between uh, him and nature and he's about to lose and uh, that's what we we are going to see in the last uh, sentence and uh he's now recognizing how small he feels how powerless he is mm -hmm. and uh He's about to to lose his fights. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and I, I would just say I, I would just say that the, the reason I think Sophie is correct that he's about to lose his fight is it it seems like that this is really a feigned desire for asceticism. I I don't think he wants to win the fight. I think he almost mm -hmm. wants mm -hmm. to be defeated by beauty to be defeated by nature or that that he's sort of fatalistic about it that because as sophie alluded to earlier there was you know there was he led a very dissatisfied life hence why he um you know would experiment with hashish and visit uh the opium eater eaters and stuff like that um he knew nothing else but to be a poet it seemed kind of like the process of elimination it's like well i guess i'll do this i can't i'm not really fit for anything else and he knows that he's sort of just destined to live this bifurcated existence between transcendence and and torture by beauty and like sophie says he knows he's going to lose and i'm just adding to that i think he might realize that he has no choice and that he may embrace his loss Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and so I guess we're ready for the last line, the coup de grace. Uh, the temptation, uh, I'm sorry, the contemplation of beauty is a duel where the artist screams with terror before being vanquished. So it kind of plays into what Sophie was saying is that uh, uh, he's not going to win this fight. Uh, for him, even though he being an artist, I think it's more than just his his artisticness, more him, him being from an artist's point of view, but he can't find solace in his contemplation of uh, nature's beauty. He, he begins to find it. He begins to try to go there. But when he does, it does never turns out the way he expects it to. It, it always kind of goes in the opposite direction. Uh, he can't express himself in uh, its beauty in words. This is the frustration that he has here. Uh, what I think is also going on here is his inability to express that reversibility by showing the paradoxical nature of having both beauty and insensibility, which he alluded to a little earlier, that uh, she's beautiful, but she's cold and unmovable emotionally. She cares nothing of his despair, only of her beauty, uh, her own beauty. In other words, he sees nature here almost as a seductress who's just interested in herself, not interested in offering him any kind of solace or any kind of uh, uh, peace, uh, any kind of healing, recognizing him even as an individual. Uh, 
That's and and again that that last part of the line of being uh, he screams with terror kind of reminds me of the existential scream where he's saying I give up, you know I kind of give up I have to just kind of offer I mean I don't know what to do. He sees himself in that sense of of being vanquished rather than uh, on equal level with nature. Sophie. Yes, I'm sorry. I was a little distracted because uh, I had the, the phone calling. So I... <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. It's happened to us all. Of course. Um, but uh, yes, it's uh, really. Uh, the the end <laughs> of the fight <laughs> and uh, the. It's really the moral of the the poem. I think he, it's what uh, Baudelaire wants us to uh, remember. It's the lesson uh, that uh, uh, the poet uh, will, will never win his uh, his fight against beauty and against uh, yes, he will never win. So it's it's like uh, um, I don't know if you you read the. Also in French, there is uh, La Fontaine, La Fontaine, who is doing uh, uh, poems, and uh, at at the end there was always a moral, and uh, it was the a lesson we can, uh, you have you the the author wants to, the the reader to to remember. Yeah, and I think it's an incredibly memorable moral and i'll just say this um when when i worked in the artistic world i also worked um with uh philanthropies that um specialize in providing mental health care for artists and a lot of people would ask me all the time about the 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 trope of the tortured artist and whether or not I believed in it or not and I would sort of dismiss it because I didn't want to romanticize it um, mm -hmm. and and have more people meet a fate that uh, I wanted to see them avoid but I think what Baudelaire does here is he gives us a brilliant philosophical psychoanalytical insight into um, the, the the true chaos that the creator and observer of beauty experiences and provides us like sophie said that cautionary tale um it, it lets us know what we're getting into when we're getting into the beauty business and um for that i'm really thankful for this poem i i i have nothing left to say really i just want to say that this was doing this poem with you too was has been a incredibly edifying experience and possibly one of the most fulfilling educational things I've I, I have done in, in in recent memory and I just want to thank you both so much for being vulnerable and being brave to attack it in this in this public setting so um, I'll I'll step aside and, and let you guys offer any sort of concluding thoughts uh, thank you so 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 much to have invited me to to do this and uh, it was really moving to to talk to you uh, <laughs> and i'm very thankful <laughs> yes yes I, I i think i speak for robert as well we we're, we're very thankful to have gone through this poem with you absolutely absolutely yeah it was just uh I got tired of just talking to Luke. It's always nice to have somebody else in, in the group. So, but at Luke, I want to thank you too for inviting me because uh, I, I thought I would have been the last person anybody would invite to do poetry with. I, you know, that would be just wasn't even one of my options in life. So, I thank you for opening this up to me. Uh, I know if after listening to you and Sophie, I have a long way to go to start really understanding poetry. Uh, so I, I, what you saw was the first attempt. Hopefully there'll be more attempts, but thanks for both of you for uh, uh, 
uh, opening up uh, Baudelaire anyway to me. So uh, thanks again. No problem. Uh, all right. So uh, I guess we'll bring this edition of Noetic to a close and we'll get it uploaded to the app and website and um, just everybody download the app and spread this around to your friends and Sophie and Robert and I will powwow about what we can do in the future. All right. Take care, everyone. Okay. Bye-bye. Goodbye. <laughs>